Major support for Carolina Business Review is provided by Grant Thornton. Operating in more than 100 countries, our tax audit and advisory professionals specialize in helping companies unlock their growth potential. Colonial Life, providing benefits to employees to help them protect their family, their finances, and their futures. And Sunoco, a global manufacturer of consumer and industrial packaging products and provider of packaging services with more than 300 operations in 35 countries. Business is good. Of course, we've been able to say that for 10 years now. What's unique about it now is we approach the longest expansion in U.S. history. It almost feels commonplace. Welcome again to the most widely watched source of Carolina business policy and public affairs. I am Chris William, and for more than 28 years now, we've brought you a dialogue about this region's challenges, its celebrations, its issues. And of course, this program will be no different. Joining us in just a moment, Carlos Phillips from the Greenville Area Chamber and Eric Spanberg from the Charlotte Business Journal. Later on, Palmetto State's Chief Educator, Superintendent Molly Spearman joins us again. Gratefully acknowledging support by Blue Cross Blue Shield of South Carolina, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. Visit us at SouthCarolinaBlues.com. The Duke Endowment, a private foundation enriching communities in the Carolinas through higher education, health care, rural churches, and children's services. Bearings, a leading global asset management firm dedicated to meeting the evolving investment and capital needs of its clients. Learn more at Bearings.com. On this edition of Carolina Business Review, Carlos Phillips from the Greenville Chamber, Eric Spanberg of the Charlotte Business Journal, and special guest, Molly Spearman, South Carolina Superintendent of Education. Welcome to our program. Thank you for watching, gentlemen. Welcome back. Thank you. Thanks for having us. You know, let's start with sports. That seems appropriate here, um, especially the Carolina Panthers. So, Eric, you've done more than stories, but you've followed the new owner of the Carolina Panthers, David Tepper. Here's a hedge fund guy from New York City, grew up in Pennsylvania, part owner, small part owner of the Pittsburgh Steelers, but now he owns the Carolina's Panther, Carolina Panthers. What's different about the Carolina's NFL franchise now than it was when Mr. Richardson owned them? Well, there are a lot of things different. First of all, um, there's not a lot of Mr. Tepper. It's Dave. Uh, so, you know, uh, somewhere along the way, Jerry became Mr. Richardson in the NFL. But uh, Dave, David Tepper for now is, is Dave. So uh, the other thing that really jumps out, of course, is that he has been much more accessible to the media, which, of course, is an extension of the fans knowing what's going on with their team. I think that his meeting a couple weeks ago with a group of reporters uh, was very beneficial in that regard of just giving people a sense of his impressions of his first year as an owner, what he wants to do, and, and kind of setting the agenda going into 2019. Sports fans are so much more sophisticated yeah. and so much more demanding now. I think that's a minimum. That's a, that's a baseline of what people expect. But is, if we look at the Panthers as an economic development asset for the Charlotte region or the Carolinas, would you expect that now – the, the, the uncertainty around what might happen with that franchise to leave or not leave, how would you handicap that? And then the second part of it, do you think this will be a more inclusive franchise now under this new owner? Well, uh, it, in what way do you mean inclusive? Well, inclusive meaning, uh, he, I, I hear David Tepper now talking more about the two states and not just mm -hmm. the, uh, yeah. Charlotte as being the home for the I, Panthers. I think a couple of things. So he certainly has embraced the two states, one team, which is one of their uh, tags or advertising tags. Uh, he certainly has embraced that. To be fair to Jerry Richardson, he was always a two-state guy. Yeah. He established that training camp in Spartanburg at Wofford, which was his alma mater, and they always emphasized the two states. That's why they're called the Carolina Panthers and not the Charlotte Panthers. So the first regime did that. I think that David Tepper has been very adamant that he wants to continue that. He's going to continue it in different ways. One of the things that he told us a few weeks ago is Spartanburg is likely out. That's probably not the long-term training camp home. And that ties into the team wanting to build this team practice headquarters mm -hmm. facility. It's a trend in the NFL. Then you do some private development around it, generate some more revenue. All those things are in line with the thinking across the NFL. And 
the smart money says that will happen in South Carolina, not in Spartanburg, probably yeah. in Rock Hill or Fort Clo Mill. Closer to Charlotte. Yeah. yeah, so that's the way he's leading. You right know, now. in Dallas, they call it, and I promise the last question, Carlos, I know, I know if you probably want to join the conversation here. In Dallas, they call it Jerry's World, and this is a Dallas uh, Cowboys facility. You think it will be as grand as something like that? Well, I don't know that many people can top Jerry Jones in Texas for <laughs> audacity, but I do think that when you're talking about a guy that's worth $11, $12 billion as a hedge fund trader, as you said, his ambitions are not small, so yeah. I don't think he's going to be half-hearted about it, but as big as Jerry's world would be uh, quite a feat. Uh, Carlos, <laughs> we talk about two teams, and I think of Greenville Health Systems, Palmetto Health. They are now ones called Prisma. Mm -hmm. How does that change the landscape for healthcare? I think um, it will benefit healthcare in South Carolina, particularly you know middle, the Midlands uh, and, and the Upstate. Economies of scale are very important right now. Uh, in healthcare, so with Palmetto Health and Greenville Health combining, I think that will help them achieve their uh, help them achieve some important financial goals, uh, and I think it will help them deliver better quality uh, care uh, to the folks uh, in their service areas as well. Do you, do you think what's what's the risk? Bigger organization, and I know I know a lot of uh, hospitals or at least providers talk about mergers in terms of cost savings, mm -hmm. lower cost for patients, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Do you think that it, when we look back on this merger in two or three or five years, do you think that will be uh, man manifest? Or what do you think a risk as, as we see more and more of these consolidations would be? Uh, Chris, I really don't see a lot of risk uh, with the merger. Uh, Greenville Health has been very involved in the community. Uh, a lot of uh, endeavors around the community, very generous, um, and they invest heavily in the community. My sense is that Palmetto Health did the same thing uh, in the Midlands, that they were very engaged as well. And, and both entities, now that they're one, uh, they've committed to, to staying engaged. And that's usually the biggest risk when you have big mergers like this. But I don't see, I don't have any sense that that will change in the future. Uh, in, in Charlotte, and I think of your area of dominant influence, uh, Novant is now, mm -hmm grappling with this idea that they've lost some docs, Atrium Healthcare, yeah. which used to be Carolina's healthcare system, lost about 80 docs mm -hmm. last year around the same issue. Do you think this is a result of some of these larger and larger merger, mergers in healthcare? I, I think it's a combination of everything that you see going on in healthcare. It is so complex. Uh, you have so many arcane or, or uh, involved uh, agreements, contracts. Yeah. I think this is a, a natural outgrowth. I mean, I don't think that it's unique. I know it's not unique to Charlotte or the Carolinas. That's just part of the battles of being in that industry right now. Yeah. Okay, that'll be the last word. We'll bring our guest on in just a moment. Coming up on this program, actually next week, you know, one of the big headlines of recent has been this idea that Dominion out of Virginia, Dominion Energy purchased Scana. That's a legacy company in South Carolina. That means something. Next week on this program, uh, she heads one of the largest utilities in this country. She's been on this program before. Her name is Lynn Good. She is the chair, or chair, president, and chief executive officer of Duke Energy. She will be our guest on the program. And then also coming up, Ravi Kumar from Infosys out of the Triangle talks about all things tech. So join us for that as well. If you more than glance at the resume of our guest, you might think that she was born but also bred to lead educators. Her past responsibilities included, but are not limited to, a public school teacher, a music teacher, an assistant principal, an executive director for the state school administrators, four terms in the South Carolina House, and of course, deputy state superintendent. And now in her fifth year as South Carolina State Superintendent of Education, the Honorable Molly Spearman. Your Honor, welcome to the program. Thank you. It sounds like I've lived a long time. <laughs> it does. <laughs> How can that possibly be? Well, I was double, I was double duty there yeah. for a while. Um, well, welcome, and good to have you back. Here we are uh, well into South Carolina's what many call the short session in the State House. Uh, Madam Superintendent, you feel like you're going to get traction for educators, for kids, for teachers. It's really an exciting time. I've never seen the stars so aligned. I thought they were aligned four years ago, <laughs> and they were, but it's even better. Uh, I've been talking about lots of the things that I think we need to do in South Carolina. It's been a great four years. We've worked so closely with our business leaders and made significant improvements in how our students are leaving high school better prepared, trained to go straight into the workforce or, or with the skills they need. But uh, everyone knows that there are really two systems in South Carolina, a world-class system and a not-so-world-class system. 
and there's a lot of focus now on what can we do to give these opportunities to our students no matter where they live, and particularly out in the rural areas mm -hmm. of our state. You know, and I, uh, Ms. Spearman, I, I, I'm not pessimistic about this, but as you said, four years ago, even Speaker Lucas was excited about the prospect of helping yeah. education. Do you get the sense that this time there is going to be real traction? I think so, uh, I know so. Um, and there were some things we had to do to get ready for this day. Uh, over the last four years, we've written our new accountability system, which previously had just been based on ACT score. And with the business community, we know that it's a lot more that we have to do in education training and students having the skills, the industry credentials. So over the last four years, we've developed a plan now where high schools have an incentive to do better, to offer more. Mm -hmm. And our most recent report cards came out. So we went, Chris, from the 16-17 school year, we gave over 9,000 industry credentials to our high school students, which was pretty mm -hmm. good. Last year we did over 22,000. That type of growth in one year. So we have built this system, we have these opportunities, they continue to grow. So that was good and a great accomplishment, but we know there are students who don't have those opportunities now and we're really focusing on making that change, mm -hmm. making that investment that will pull up the whole state um, and really we need those young people mm. and they just clearly have not had the opportunities and it's in facilities, uh, it's in quality of the teachers, uh, re teacher recruitment and retention, it's in teacher salary, so there are lots of things that we have to address in our state. Mm -hmm. Eric? Well, one thing I was curious about, I, w I was reading the, the new study or the recent study that Winthrop University had done about teachers and there was a 16% mm -hmm. increase in vacancies. Uh, South Carolina is certainly not alone in having issues with teacher pay and teacher retention. What's your perspective on, on where you are and, and what you can do to really improve some of those numbers and keep those teachers in the system? Well, it's a huge challenge. Uh, anytime that the economy is really strong and unemployment mm -hmm. is low, we have a teacher shortage. <laughs> you can look back over the trends over the last 50 years. So it, there's a, a natural uh, problem there. Uh, we're, first thing, we're looking at uh, raising teacher pay. Mm -hmm. Our teachers have to have a competitive salary. So it looks like uh, possibly at least a 5% raise this mm -hmm. year, could be more. Uh, I, I certainly support that. But teachers tell me they're leaving because they don't feel like they have the support they need. So I've had focus groups over the last few months and we've really drilled down and I think it comes a lot to two things. Safety, uh, you know all the tragedies that have happened. Why would, you, why would you do that and go into teaching and know that that's gonna be an issue? And also the tremendous emotional issues that students are coming to school with mm -hmm. now as we see in society. So together, uh, Chief um, Kill with SLED, uh, John McGill with the Department of Mental Health and I have agreed and now Governor McMaster has joined us to say by 2022, we are gonna have a school resource officer in every school. We have about 300 schools now who do not have resource officers. And we're gonna have a mental health counselor in every school and access to telepsychiatry for our students. We're about halfway there, it's very doable. Those type of supports are I think what teachers are saying when they say, we, we don't have enough support, we, discipline is out of hand. It's really not, it's just that children are bringing so many issues that our, our professionals don't, are not trained mm -hmm. to handle. You're, you're about what, 38, 39 in Thank teacher you. pay? Well, <laughs> oh, in teacher pay, I thought <laughs> yeah, you yeah, yeah, my yeah. age. No, you, you, may, you may be 38 years <laughs> old as well, but I, I was gonna ask. Nice North, cover. Uh, nice cover, <laughs> nice cover. <laughs> North Carolina and South Carolina are, are neck and neck. They're, lower right. 30s, right? right. Uh, and, and we have this conversation in every state, teachers must be paid right. more. Realistically, I know you'd like to be number one, but realistically, what's a healthy range in terms of teacher pay? If you get in the top half, is that acceptable? I think so, well, and we look at it, I tend to look at it as the southeastern average. Now, some people are saying we need to be at the national average, which would be wonderful, but realistically, the cost of living in my little hometown of Saluda, South <laughs> Carolina, is not the same as it is in Charleston or New York City. So, uh, realistically, I talk about being at the top, and we were, South Carolina was at the top until 2008 in the southeastern average. So, competing with our neighboring states is is uh, is usually the standard uh, that we set. We do have some areas like Charleston though had that has taken on their local board is saying we want to be at the national average. So you're going to see uh, some different goals. 
Uh, the challenge, though, is that when that happens, teachers leave the rural areas neighboring Charleston mm -hmm. County to go in. So uh, it, it's we are going to address the teacher salary schedule in our state. I think that might take us two years to do that. But in the short term, an immediate raise for all teachers would be really helpful. Carlos. Um, one thing we missed in Molly's introduction was she still plays piano <laughs> in her church. Oh, I do. <laughs> That's my hobby. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, K through 12 education is the, the building blocks uh, for, our, for our workforce. Um, what else can, what are other things that the business community can the business community do to help you yeah. achieve your goals? Well, they have helped teach me what they need. Mm -hmm. uh, I was uh, not as aware as I should have been, nor are, do I think principals and teachers are aware of really what industry looks like now. So there's much more collaboration, much more communication going on over the last four years. I went to an industry not far from Greenville and I walked in thinking I was taking the tour and in the summer found nine teachers who were there actually working uh, <laughs> to learn about the industry. So that type of communication telling us what you need. I think now we need you to involve students to offer work-based opportunities uh, for students to get out and get a little uh, hands-on mm -hmm. and to see what it's really like to let young children mm -hmm. uh, see inside your doors, let parents know what the salaries <laughs> possibilities are, <laughs> that they don't necessarily have to go to a four-year school to have a great career. So those type of uh, really educating parents and teachers. And then I would ask, I always say cause, uh, to industry, because I live out in the rural area in Saluda County and we don't really have any industry within our county lines, but our people drive 20 miles, 50 miles to work. I mm. think industry typically helps the schools right there in the district that mm. they live in, mm. even though their employees may be coming from 50 miles away. So I encourage industry folks to branch out a little bit because <laughs> those folks out in the rural areas, they need your support. They need those opportunities to come work. They need your financial support. Mm -hmm. uh, right now, we need you to help put equipment in career centers. Mm -hmm. um, and we need you maybe to share some of your employees to be part-time teachers because mm -hmm. it's hard for mm -hmm. us to find the people to teach mechatronics. Mm -hmm. So being very close, uh, I'm so excited because I've never had the close collaboration with the Department of Commerce, with the Department of Labor. Uh, workforce in South Carolina mm -hmm. like we have now. We meet regularly. There, in that same vein, Madam Superintendent, the idea, North Carolina's found pretty tremendous success in this middle college program mm -hmm. in the technical colleges in South Carolina, yes. I know, but I want to take it a little bit further. Virtual SC is doing something that's non-traditional. Mm -hmm. Oconee County Schools are looking at a changing and modifying the calendar for year round. Is it going to take those kind of non-traditional um, risk taking that uh, you're clearly not afraid to take. Is that where, is that how you get policy? Is that how you get money? Absolutely. Is that how you get it, and there's no one answer. So we're open to all suggestions. <laughs> Our virtual SC, I'm glad you mentioned that. We're the fifth largest virtual school in the nation. Uh, typically for high school courses, we offer an array of advanced ed courses, really most anything a high school student can need, we can offer. And we have recently now started offering CAKE courses, career courses there, which will help with this rural issue of the children there not having the opportunities. So we're open to everything. Uh, you know, we're right now, I will tell you in South Carolina, I think one thing that we have not focused on is the governance structure of some of our smallest school districts. And you, you'll hear the legislature has given me the authority to work with our 13 smallest districts, which are all under 1,500 students. We have three districts that are under 600 students. They're rural, they're in a multi-county. They must start sharing services. Laden, Colleton counties like that? Right, Bamberg, uh, Hampton, mm -hmm. those at Florence County where really they're spending too much money on administration. And we need, to, we need to share services, share those personnel so that that additional funding can drive down for more opportunities for students. Very difficult conversation. <laughs> but it's one that we are having openly now. We couldn't, we were not having that four years ago. We we're talking about it openly, working with districts now to say you need to be sharing food services or you need to be sharing your finance director. So um, a bold conversation that people were very uh, 
complacent about having four it, years ago. Let me ask you a quick follow-up. I promise, Eric, you can get another chance. <laughs> Do you find that the General Assembly is willing to not write you a blank check, but give you carte blanche to take these ideas, fund it, and say, however the superintendent's office wants to run with it, it's okay with us? That's what they're saying. We'll mm -hmm. see at the end of the <laughs> yeah, session, okay? okay? <laughs> uh, I've put some requests on the table. Uh, so far, they've been very supportive of me. They really have. I'll, I'll give them credit. Uh, even they, I, I really appreciate that they see how hard this work is. It is not just education, it's not just business, it is health care, it is mental health care. Mm -hmm. The places that are failing in education are also failing in health care and they have no business there. So Governor McMaster very wisely has pushed a hundred million dollars into the Department of Commerce to go and work in our 28 lowest performing and poorest school districts for infrastructure. If there is an industry, if they need a water system mm -hmm. or, or whatever. So I think that realization is, brand, is, is not new, but it's the first time that we've really put money mm -hmm. in the pot to say, this is, it's not, a, it's a chicken and egg. They've got to go along together. Uh, business development, economic development, along with building the education infrastructure yeah. as well. Yeah. As Chris said at the, at the start, it does seem like you were born to do this. And I'm <laughs> curious, as someone who's been a, a teacher, you've also been a lawmaker, uh, what do those two sides tend to not understand about the other that inhibits our educational system? I think educators uh, don't tend to just think about education and uh, say we need more money, we need more money. Uh, it is about management, it is about leadership, um, and sometimes their money is there, but it just has not been spent wisely. So they're always going to the legislature for more money. I tell them, you know, we've got to do better, we've got to spend it more wisely, and then we can ask for more money. <laughs> uh, legislators, I think, I, I don't think they realize what a difficult challenge some teachers have. It's fairly easy to teach your children mm -hmm. and well-educated children, mm -hmm. uh, but in poverty, mm -hmm. when there's so many adverse circumstances that have happened to children. All those demands you're talking about that come with that it. That have happened to children, how difficult. We have classrooms, as in North Carolina, where every child shows up ready at mm -hmm. five years old. Your children, your mm -hmm. grandchildren. Mm -hmm. Then we have classrooms where not a single child showed ready. Mm -hmm. But yet we expect the teacher and the school to have everyone ready, reading on grade level by third grade, end of third grade. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So it's a huge challenge. Um, and I try to bring that message to legislators. Uh, I'm pretty defensive, <laughs> I think. But uh, people need to appreciate each other and that there is no one silver program that's going to change it. Mm -hmm. There are many things that have to go together to really get the change that we need. Carlos. Uh, Superintendent, I attended a uh, teacher feedback session uh, recently, mm. and while teacher pay was certainly a concern of those teachers, probably one of the larger concerns that they expressed was the administrative component of teaching today, the amount of time that they have to spend on lesson plans. Right. Um, they also had con some concerns about standardized yeah. testing uh, and what have you. Are you hearing that feedback? Ab absolutely. Everywhere I go, there is no doubt that our accountability, business wants mm -hmm. accountability, we want accountability, but this huge burden of testing and of reporting has changed education. Uh, we think of it as the norm. It wasn't, it is not, the, was not mm -hmm. the norm, at least 20 years ago My when I was in the class. My mother was a 30-year educator. Yeah, you took one, maybe the Iowa basic skills <laughs> test, and so while accountability has been a good thing, I think, I personally think that the pendulum has gone too far. We need to relax some of the assessments. Mm -hmm. We need to let the assessments be more of, uh, of tools that are going to give teachers information. The high-stakes mm -hmm. tests at the end of the year really do not give teachers any information. They give us a little mm -hmm. information about mm -hmm. how we can rate one school. To be honest with you, I could probably tell you how that's going to turn out by just looking at the poverty level. And we're putting mm -hmm. a tremendous amount of money and responsibility mm -hmm. and angst on school people because of that. So I, I believe the pendulum is swinging back. We are doing a study Right now, the legislature has asked us to, and I'm going to hold some focus groups on, is there any way we can cut out some of the burden of reporting? There's an awful lot. You've heard it for t from teachers forever. But even one of our legislators mm -hmm. who is a teacher and went back and taught Somali, it really has changed, and there's too much, too much. So we're going to try to address that over the next few months and look at that. 
Uh, we did the same thing on discipline. Mm -hmm. I was hearing from teachers, discipline is out of hand. I don't see it. When I go, the children are very well behaved. But again, I think when as we drill down, that was really about the social emotional mm -hmm. issues that children are bringing and mm -hmm. society has now. So this, uh, this telepsychiatry, uh, the mental health counselor, and also I've asked that when school starts next year in the 1920 year that every school in South Carolina will have a threat assessment team. And that means if someone comes in and says, we're worried about Chris, a meeting will be held. That happens a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to say that's where class ends, unfortunately, okay, we're out of sorry. time. But, but as always happens, Molly, uh, please come back because I'd there's a lot to. more to talk about. Thank you for being here and, Thank you. and thanks for your work. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Carlos, good to see you. Always. Uh, go Panthers. Right? <laughs> there you go. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Sir. Until next week, I'm Chris William. Have a good weekend. Good night. Major funding for Carolina Business Review was provided by the Duke Endowment, Bearings, Grant Thornton, Colonial Life, Sunoco, Blue Cross Blue Shield of South Carolina. And by viewers like you. Thank you. Promotional consideration provided by Business North Carolina Magazine. For more information, visit carolinabusinessreview.org.